Welcome to the Energy Summit. This is our session on Architectures for Renewables by Mads Lindbeck. Um, thank you, Roland. So, as mentioned, my name is Mads Lindbeck and I work as an uh, IoT specialist in uh, the area of Scandinavia, which is the region I cover. Uh, I am Norwegian, so I'm naturally very familiar with the oil and gas sector. We uh, are famously born with skis on our feet on top of oil barrels in Norway, but uh, that's another topic. What I will talk about today is um, another thing we are really good at in my part of the world, which is renewable energy production. And I've been given the task to talk about this for 30 minutes, which isn't that much time, to be fair. Uh, so the way I structure this is I will first talk a little bit about the trends we see within renewable, uh, and uh, then I'll move over to the challenges we see, and then I'll move over to how Cisco can help you. And especially with the network and security, which is kind of Cisco's bread and butter. So, um, for the first part, which is the trends uh, within renewable. I have shamelessly stolen uh, some slides from our friends in Ajici, which is a Italian based company, a consultancy firm that specializes in renewable. And we'll work together with them on many occasions and uh, they do great work in their analytics. So I asked to borrow some of their slide decks which is why I have a GG on top left corner here. So I don't need to tell you guys this, I think you all know, but uh, the world needs to reduce this greenhouse emission, uh, the gases. And the United, uh, the European Union has stated a goal of reducing the total emission by around 55% by 2030. And I believe Joe Biden, uh, and his government uh, has said that the absolute goal in the States is to reach net zero emissions by 2050. And that means we need to do something about the energy usage of the world. Because right now, the biggest polluter is still the energy sector, uh, which you are familiar with, of course. Now, in order to reach these targets, um, the energy sector is doing a lot of different initiatives. Roland will talk about a really interesting one really soon. But I think the common expectation is that the biggest needle mover will be the switch over to a higher percentage of renewable energy fueling the world. So what you see on this slide is that we're actually making progress, which is good. The projections are also pretty good. This is actually uh, based on numbers from the European Union. Um, but we still see that we need more investments and more movement within this space in order to reach the targets of 55% in Europe and net zero by 2050 in the States. The good thing is we do see those investments coming. It's coming from many different sources, which I will get into. But first I wanted to show you how the European Commission looks at the energy consumption split and how they estimate this will be by in 30 years, so 2050. And for those of you who are sitting on a very small screen, the orange one is renewable. And the reason they have three separate alternatives is because the total mix of renewable energy will directly impact the temperature rise on the planet. And what the European Union is estimating as a best case scenario is that we increase the amount of or the mix coming from renewable energy by 400% over the next 30 years, and then the world will only heat up 1.5 Celsius, which is good. And the graph on the right, on the other hand, is showing uh, the what renewable energy sources is 
kind of driving the most growth? What is creating the most growth and where do we expect most growth? Most growth? And the biggest me needle mover here is are definitely wind and solar as we see it today. That is the purple and pink one. And that is also the reason why I primarily will focus on those two uh, renewable sources in this presentation. So let's have a quick look at what trends are affecting this market today. And I first of all want to state that most utility companies we speak to, and it's a lot of them, are very positive to this move towards more renewable energy production. And we also see the governments being very naturally very optimistic about doing this and they want to support and help the companies drive this innovation but there are still some hurdles around the world and some bigger and some smaller and i wanted to just highlight some of them one is actually saturation of available areas so that means geography as you can see on the map on the left that is actually a heat map based on suitability for solar panels across Europe. And what we have seen the last five years or so is that the best places, the, the places that are most suited for solar energy and also have the correct or proper infrastructure like road and access have actually built a lot of solar panels, but it's built with all technology, which isn't as efficient as newer version of solar panels, which means most or not most, a big part of this equation will be overhauling and renewing existing uh, solar and wind farms. And it also means that we need new technology to create new um, or to leverage new technology to open up for energy production in very remote places. Uh, for example, oil and gas companies moving into using their expertise from offshore, which we have seen a lot of in Europe recently, where you basically use the expertise you have to build out wind farms in places where normal utility companies couldn't do that, basically. We see the same thing happening with solar panels in deserts. And this lack of available areas is driving us to be more creative and we need to invest more in that kind of uh, development in remote places the second hurdle i want to talk about is that the incentives from the governments are actually decreasing uh, especially around europe so the right uh, bars you can see is the incentive programs from the Italian government, just as an example. And what happened the last decade is we have had a boom in uh, renewable energy production in across the world, but it's very obvious in my time, my town, like Europe is my town, but in Europe, our continent. And it's been very much fueled by uh, subsidization from governments, which are now going to roll out. They're going to face this face out. That means that going forward, we will see an increased requirement for energy and cost efficiency of these deployments, which again means we really need to, or operators really need to proactively use data to efficient, create more efficient parks for energy, but also be more efficient in forecasting when energy will be available and also for maintenance purposes. So data will be very, very important for making these par parks realistic without the subsidization from the governments. And the last trend I wanted to talk about, which is a good one for at least for renewable, is the price of CO2 is rising. And this is basically making renewable more sensible of a choice compared to non-renewable, uh, which is good if we want to move towards this direction in the world. 
So to sum this up, firstly, we see a move away from feed in tariffs. That is basically procurement mechanisms designed to incentivize um, uh, renewable energy production. And we're seeing a move towards more competitive uh, procurement models. Second one is we see a lot of investments happening in the sector, which is good, it's great. We see growth from large existing operators, could be utility companies, many of them are previously state-owned. But it can also be competition from new entrants, let's say an oil company, for example, going into this area. And the last one is we need faster deployment and we need bigger deployment for if we are supposed or if we are supposed to have any chance of reaching the goals, we need a higher adoption rate um, and we need faster adoption rate. And that means that we need to drive for more efficiency, um, which again, it's very much depending on data and data-driven decisions. I think that's gonna be a key part of this. The second is we need, we will see an increase in remote installation because of the lack of places that is suitable in the world it means we need to be more creative. And once you start putting out uh, wind parks in very remote places, you will see that that puts a very big strain on what you can do from a network perspective and what that require from your network, because it needs to be as autonomous as possible. And the last one is optimization of production to smart asset management and reducing OEM costs. Those are things I will not go through in my presentation, but I do believe we will cover those areas uh, in other uh, areas in this uh, during these two days. So I wanted to do, just show you this slide because these trends uh, that we're talking about, the demand for remote sites, the the demand for more efficient use of these production sites will require new tools to make that happen. And these are uh, some of the things that we see in the market that other customers are using or companies are using today to be more efficient. One of it is of course IoT. You basically need to monitor functions, temperature, processes, and it is, it's endless, basically, what you can measure in today's environment. The question is, um, what do we need to measure? And also having that base understanding that generating that data and owning that data is fundamental for enabling these other tools, which means ownership of sensor data will be a big part of the future. Uh, we see many, many companies going in that direction of actually in the contract when they go out to source these wind turbines uh, demand access or even ownership of data the second one is edge computing and that is especially relevant for remote plants we have seen in the last 10 years that the cost of compute power and the form factor are really going down which enables you to do much more analytics on the edge, closer to where it's happened. And when you start rolling out these huge parks in remote places, you don't necessarily have a reliable backhaul. And if you do, that backhaul transportation might be very expensive and it might be far away from a centralized decision-making place, which means edge computing will alleviate some of that pain by making the decisions on site as close as possible to the turbines. One example we've seen has been turbines, wind turbines being positioned towards the wind, uh, depending on different sensor types. And you want that decision to happen fast to get as much as possible out of the wind. Third one is advanced analytics and diagnostics. In this area, it's usually connected to predictive maintenance, which is one of two options. One, you buy it from whoever created the turbine. Number two, you do the analytics yourself. You do the predictive maintenance and you own the data. The benefit of the second solution is 
that we see companies who went that route start doing analytics and diagnostics on other types of data, basically correlating the SCADA network and SCADA data from the turbines with weather, uh, weather and wind information to try to accurately predict how much power will this turbine produce on Monday in two days, for example. And starting because accurately forecasting production is very important for the world if we're going to solve this puzzle because it blows when it blows, but the more you know about when it blows, the more you can kind of alleviate with other energy sources because you constantly are uh, depending on these sources uh, like wind or solar being available. And that's not always the case. Third one is physical security. In my country, Norway, we, for some reason, hate wind turbines because we think they destroy the beautiful mountain view, which have meant that we actually have a lot of cases where they're being sabotaged by people who think they don't look very nice or that they're killing off the birds, which isn't a good thing. But that means that we see an increased amount of security measures being taken on these sites cameras, uh, other types of uh, security, physical security, which is connected to the network for monitoring purposes. And another thing is because it's so remote, you don't often have cell connectivity, which means that if you send a maintenance personnel there, they usually want to leverage some kind of Wi-Fi or communication backhaul using the network, uh, which, again, means you're connecting more and more stuff to these networks. It's not just a SCADA traffic anymore. It's a very mixed environment. And then we have digital twins. Now, this is, of course, more of a concept than anything, but we do see it for the larger plants, both solar and wind. And this is depending on all of the above. You need uh, edge computing, you need the data from the IoT sensors, you need the analytics piece. And of course, you need the visualization tools. And the last one is cybersecurity, which is kind of where we at Cisco, that this is one of the things we're really, really good at. And cybersecurity isn't a technology in itself, but it is an enabler of all of the other technologies. Because I wouldn't recommend anyone starting feeding a digital twin with sensor information unless you're very much sure that that stream is secure because you don't want these to stop. And the bigger these sites become, the more dependent the grid will be of that production, which means there are going to come high regulations from governmental institutions, especially ones uh, we start building out bigger parks, for example, Dogger Bank outside of Scotland, which will fuel 5 million people in the UK, then that's a national infrastructure. It's critical that nothing happens to that site. So cybersecurity is definitely gonna be a part of this. So let's have a quick look at what we can do. Kind of like, what are we thinking? And I'm going to focus mostly on network and security because that's again what we're what I'm good at and what Cisco is good at. And the first thing we see is we're being asked a lot to uh, support and connectivity to remote remote locations. And remote locations is tricky because naturally they our customers don't want to make unnecessary trips. Very often, there's very bad coverage. Uh, I'll get back to that. But it sets very specific demands for the network. Second one is, which I touched upon, is the multi-service environment that we're starting to see on these sites. As I mentioned, it's not just uh, SCADA traffic going back anymore uh, to a controller and doing the basics of a wind turbine. We're, we're seeing that workforce enablement, video surveillance, access control for the doors, uh, and it's starting to become much, much more complex. And that links back to the sentence to the left, the use cases drive the network design. It's a huge difference between a, a rooftop solar installment on top of an IKEA store and Dogger Bank, where you have 500 
Eiffel Tower sized turbines where one swing of the turbine creates enough energy for two households for entire day. And we see a surprising amount of things being connected to these networks, which means segmentation needs to be in place. Do you want physical segmentation, which we see in many do, or do you want uh, basically the network segmentation using VLAN? And you need to have this constant view on what is being connected and what will probably be connected over the next 10 years, because you're building for tools that you're not necessarily using today. All of these tools aren't being leveraged by all of our customers all the time. We usually see they do some of them and they try and they fail and they do try again and it works. And we, you should build this platform thinking that there will be many, many more services that you need to deliver um, in these environments. And the last one we're being asked a lot about is edge compute and data gathering. The customers or companies are getting much, much more uh, aware of the value of the data in these sites and they want to do more with them. And at the same time, they see that they can't backhaul all of the traffic. So edge computing, edge, edge analytics makes a lot of sense for these, especially when they're trying to squeeze out as much power as they can from the wind to be reach the required uh, targets. Um, I wanted to also quickly talk a bit about remote site connectivity, like kind of what are the design considerations that we recommend usually when we engage customers around this or they come to us. And the first one is, of course, uh, connectivity options, you need industrial grade hardware. Seems very obvious, but we have had many cases where companies have to fly a helicopter to a very remote site or take a bold, long boat trip because the switch has died because it didn't stand the cold. Some simple stuff like that. The second is we, you do have a lot of wireless or van connectivity options in the world but they're usually very limited in these places. And you usually have to kind of do what you get is kind of the attitude we see. That can be some places you can use the fiber and backhaul using the grid net operators, fiber net. Other places you have to use wireless. It could be 3G, it can be 4G. We haven't seen 5G close to cities. And it might be in some cases that you have a stable 3G link, but an unstable 4G link, and you have to prioritize what to use. The second one is build with security in mind first, because it's really difficult and really expensive to retrofit security in remote uh, sites. This is very, very important when you're planning for enabling these tools that I talked about, the, the analytics tools, and basically you're picking up data from your OT network or production network, and you're doing something in, with that data in the IT world. And you need to plan for that. Even if you're not doing it right now, the chances are in order for that uh, power plant, that solar plant, the wind farm to stay relevant for as long as possible, they would need to do that at some stage. And the last one is automation and management. Um, Again, we've seen misconfigured switches, removing as much as possible human touch using templates and other easy solutions. Uh, SD-WAN, which will be covered later, uh, is a very interesting topic. And then centralized management uh, for monitoring, but also for configuring and updates. Uh, some sites can have it, some sites can't, but that needs to be a part of the planning early on. It's very difficult to retrofit this to a remote site. Hey, Matt, um, yep. I, uh, I know you've got a ton of really awesome stuff here still, um, but uh, we probably won't get a chance to get through it all here in the, in the next few minutes. But I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, when you... Yes. When you look at the operation and who's doing what in which type of uh, of architecture, 
my understanding is that wind and solar have two very kind of different operating models. Um, wind yes. is much more complex and probably more like the traditional oil and gas sites. Um, and, and incidentally, I think it's probably true that uh, oil and gas companies like Equinor, Shell, BP, a lot of these big uh, oil and gas companies that you work with, um, they they have invested a ton into wind power, right? Um, yeah. Are they building their own uh, um, organizations to 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 install and manage these environments, or or is most of that pretty separate from the oil and gas organizations? I know we've got a lot of uh, people on on the line here that are doing consulting work and and helping out oil and gas companies with various things. Like, is this an area that they can kind of specialize in and get into some of these uh, more specialized projects? Where is the opportunity? That is an excellent question. Uh, what we have seen, what I have seen, is it depend on the plans for the the site itself. Like, okay. uh, oil and gas companies are really good at creating uh, or offshore, for example, setting up this okay. offshore. They use their expertise, but they plan to sell it off within the three next three years. Then, then it's about creating a platform, but they usually then segment this out in its or, or own organization, which basically uh, either follows the trans, uh, transaction when they sell the park or manage several different parks and just kind of like keeps getting them and selling them. But we have seen other cases where they buy it to run it and to be a part of their organization and to leverage the data. And then it's usually the same teams that we work on with uh, uh, with the um, rigs and uh, like the traditional oil and gas business. It's usually then the same people that we are working with. And, it, and because That's it's fine. relatively early days, we'll probably see this evolve a little bit in the years to come, especially with the growth that you're talking about. And I'll share a few numbers on that in a minute here. Um, but yeah, the growth is absolutely astronomical. I looked at a uh, a graph of the the wind projects that are in flight within the EU, and and I think the ones that were operational was like 0.5 percent of of all of the projects that were on the list, right? And like 60 percent are still in development, and the others are 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 really early days. So there's a lot a lot of capacity being worked on right now, and and. Uh, a lot of that is actually being driven by oil and gas companies, which is uh, which is kind of why we want to um, we want to highlight it here, right? Um, the, is there the a couple of other, now? Uh, uh, I just want to ex ex exemplify because because of the need for proficiency, the turbines are getting bigger and bigger, and they're now right. so big that if they stop swinging, they will break. It's the construction is built now that it have to have a constant movement. Uh, so there's even engines within it. Uh, so that's kind of, we're, we're at the limit now of engineering to squeeze out as much energy as we can from the wind. It's really, really interesting. Do you have a, a couple yeah. more slides you wanna share with us? And then I wanna, I'll, I wanna pull into some other things here. Or maybe one more to wrap I, things up. Yeah, I quickly wanted to just quickly touch upon security because that's usually the thing we're asked most about is kind of how do we secure this? And it is the uh, it is basically about getting visibility. Uh, once you have visibility, and I'm talking visibility into the OT traffic. The the I, the cameras is pretty simple and easy. With, or, We've done that from the IT side a long time, but once the turbines start communicating with Profinet, then you need to have uh, some kind of tool to decipher or to analyze this. And Cisco, we have CyberVision, which will provide you with visibility into what's in the network, what is communicating, how are they communicating, when are they communicating? And based on that information, you can move to step two, which is segmentation. We see usually segmentation of five turbines in one ring uh, being physically segmented, but it could also be internally inside the controllers and stuff. So it all depends on how deep you want to go. 
And then live threat detection is also very important because we have example of uh, bad actors going out with boats trying to connect the 4G and the Raspberry Pi connector into this. And physical security is one thing, but you also need to understand when something is connected. Again, these are getting more and more important for the world's energy consumption. So we, we need to take security very, very seriously in the bigger sites. And then I'm talking wind primarily. Solar is easier in that regard. It's much less energy, more cost uh, dependent. So wind, it's kind of like where we see the biggest investment in security going. So that was kind of like my pet piece. I also wanted to say that we are working on a renewable CVD in Cisco. That's a Cisco validated design for these kind of sites. Uh, I think it's that will enable many of you to kind of alleviate the stress of building this design yourself. We are testing it as we speak, uh, putting a lot of functionality in the substation itself around security and other things. But it's as deep as over the high level design all the way down to commando lines through CLI. So that is coming out hopefully later this year. Um, and we'll cover primarily wind, but it will be accessible to or applicable for other areas yeah. as well. Just wanted to quickly touch on that. Thank you for joining us for this session. If this session was of value to you, please like and subscribe and click on the next video. Take care.